us adore him. Oh, come, let us adore Well, good morning, uh, Lyman Wesleyan Church. Um, as you can see, we are not in our main building today. It's, uh, it's been a great day just to enjoy the cold, um, but unfortunately it prevents us from being together. And so, regrettably, here we are. Um, we're in our living room here at the Parsonage. Um, Kylie is all snuggled up reading a book, and I'm getting to be with you guys to kind of go over um, what we wanted to cover in our Bible study this morning. Um, so just, I'm going to go ahead and open up in a word of prayer, and uh, if you're watching, feel free to join me. Uh, dear God, thank you so much for today. Uh, Lord, we just thank you that uh, we have technology that allows us to connect with each other despite distance and despite weather conditions. Um, Lord, we just ask that you to be with us during this time. Allow your word to speak to us and it would transform us. Um, God, we just are so thankful to you and for this time of the year and what it means um, to us as Christians. Lord, we, uh, we just consecrate this time and we ask that you would use it to be a blessing um, to those who need it. Lord, we love you. We ask this all in your name. Amen. Um, so to open up, uh, I just have to tell you guys a little bit of a story. Um, there's always been this tradition um, with my family, especially my brother and my sister, we would always, always, we would watch uh, Home Alone growing up. It was a tradition for my brother and I and my sister to stay up and do that. And so we would just stay up all the way up until Christmas Eve, probably about two o'clock in the morning or so, just watching Home Alone. Um, that was the movie we just loved to watch so much. And we, we loved that movie because just of how much fun Kevin McAllister gets to have. He is this little boy in this movie and he um, is very spoiled, he's an oddball, he's an outcast. He eventually just says to his mom, while they're all there at his house preparing for Christmas, that he just wishes that his family would disappear. And so Kevin McAllister, his family, they're hosting all of his family, over 20 family members, and finally they get to the point where they're getting ready to go on their trip to Paris because who doesn't want a group of 20 people or more to go on this wonderful trip to Paris for Christmas? It just sounds stressful to me. But in all the chaos of getting ready, somehow Kevin ends up being home alone. He gets left, completely left behind. And so, you know, he had this moment where he had finally just asked and wished that his family would disappear. And so when he finally dawns on him that his family is gone, he kind of smirks to the camera and he says, I made my family disappear. And so he has this wonderful time, this wonderful realization, and he gets to go nuts. I mean, he goes crazy, he's dancing, he's singing, he's making a mess of the entire house. He eats junk food and drinks soda pretty much the entire movie. He eventually gets to pull a prank on a pizza delivery guy. He eventually uh, even defends the house from a couple of crooks that are looking to, to get a little bit of money off of his item in his house. And so, again, Kevin has this entire movie, this whole time where he spent just thinking that being home alone, having no family at all, that is just the perfect ideal time for Christmas. And of course, we know the benefit of the doubt, like we're here on the other side where we know just because our families can be stressful, our families can just be crazy, um, we know that the family is really where the worthwhile piece comes from. And so it takes a lot of different things within the movie, but Kevin finally comes to the realization, you know, that even though his desired peace, his desired outcome for the holidays would have been to spend it all alone by himself, he knows that being reunited with his family, especially his mom, he asked for forgiveness in the end, he knows that being with his family is the thing that's really going to give him peace. And so, while there are great, great lessons uh, about peace to learn from Kevin McAllister and his whole family, there are even greater lessons to be learned from the nativity story. And so to start, um, I'm just going to kind of go through this Bible study here on my notes, and this will be sent out to our email list as well. So if you are tuning in, be on the lookout for this. You can refer back to this video later on today or whenever you get a chance to do it. But I'm going to go through the Bible study, and you guys feel free to print it off, write in your answers as you go, just kind of use it as a visual guide as you're watching, whatever it be. Um, feel free to look back on that later on. But I'm just going to start right here. And so the first question I have is just, when you hear the word peace, what first comes to your mind? Now for me, I, I'm very introverted. It's, it's easy for me to get just exhausted um, when I, I'm in really, really intense social uh, settings. 
And so for peace for me is when I have a chance to finally just get to myself and I can have some peace and quiet. That's usually what we affiliate with peace, right? Peace and quiet. But peace for me, I, I think of just having time alone. I think of peace being something where I just, I can just rest and be totally myself. I don't have to put on a face, you know, to be social. I don't have to do something that I'm not comfortable doing. Peace just looks like me having a chance to just be myself. And so the next question though, has there ever been a time in your life when you desired something, but God provided in a different way than you expected? Now we're getting a little bit deeper here with that one, but more or less, you know, there have been times in my life where I've wanted to have something, you know, I've wanted something so, so bad. But similarly to Kevin McAllister in Home Alone, you know, the thing that I wanted really would not have been what I really, really would have wanted. You know, like just because I would have wanted, let's say, to have a car when I was 10 years old, right? I wasn't equipped to do that yet. I wasn't equipped to be able to drive. You know, I would have loved to have a million dollars, but Lord knows I don't need a million dollars, right? It, you know, there's no telling what would have happened if I were to have a million dollars. I'd be a very spoiled brat, to tell you that at least. Um, but for me, God's definitely provided in different ways than I expected, um, just in the way that, uh, just being honest, you know, I, I didn't expect to be a senior, you know, or a co-pastor only a couple years out of college, but God has been able to do that, and it's been such a rewarding journey already. Um, God just, in multiple occasions, has provided in different ways than I expected him to. Um, and so peace looks like that pretty, pretty frequently throughout the time we've been here. Um, we're going to jump into scripture now, though. Um, and so just to open up, most of us could probably tell a summary of the nativity story, right? You know, you've got Mary and Joseph. You know that Mary's a virgin and she's somehow giving birth to a son. Um, you probably know that Jesus is finally worshipped by the angels and the shepherds and the wise men. Um, but two of the characters that we probably don't think a whole lot about during the Nativity story is the story of Elizabeth and Zechariah. Now, Elizabeth was Mary's cousin. And so during their marriage, um, Elizabeth and Zechariah, they were unable to conceive children. Now, I'm sure there are only a few of us that can really imagine how terribly painful that would be to not be able to conceive children um, in marriage. And so for them, they'd gone their whole life. I mean, they were, they were credited as being righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Um, but they, they finally had an appearance of an angel. A, a, an angel appeared to Zechariah, finally in Luke 1, verses 11 through 17. And he even told him that Elizabeth would conceive a baby son, despite their inability to conceive and despite their old age. And so, as you can imagine, again, how awful and terrible it would be to be able to, uh, unable to conceive children, it's not hard to see how they probably were a little bit doubtful. They were probably questioning if that's really something that could really happen. And so Zechariah, his, his circumstances, you know, he, he was used to knowing that he was not going to be a father. He was used to knowing that he was too old, you know, like by no accounts of normal biology should he have been able to be a father at that point with Elizabeth. But yet that's what happened. And so the question then has to become, how did God provide them with peace? in their circumstances. Like, for them, they had gone their whole life, again, very righteous people. They were righteous in the eyes of the Lord. They were doing the right things. And yet, it never felt like they got to do what they wanted. You know, they never got to be the, the parents that they wanted to be until finally, God intervenes. And he, he brings an angel telling them, again, that Elizabeth is going to be pregnant. You know, that they're going to be parents. And that's eventually going to be John the Baptist, Jesus' cousin. And so another question that then becomes is, do you think Elizabeth and Zechariah were better equipped as parents because they had to wait? Now, again, I'm not, I, we're not parents yet, Kylie and I, um, but we can, we can already pretty much tell you that we're not ready to be parents. You know, like there are some lessons in life that we have just not learned yet. Um, and so for Elizabeth and Zechariah, I mean, they were wise people. They were holy people that God truly looked on in favorable ways. And yet they were finally going to be parents. And that is a blessing. You know, that is what peace looked like for them. And so, yeah, absolutely. They were better equipped to be parents because they'd had so long to wait. and They'd had so long to refine themselves and how to live holy and blameless lives. And so, again, they, they were 
looking into their promises of what God had told them to be and how they needed to live, and they were being rewarded. They were seeing the fruit of their labors and seeing that God was paying attention to them. The angel even says that your prayers have been heard and that we are going to give you this son, this great joy, and that you can have peace in that. Now again, Zechariah doubted, and so he eventually was, he was muted by, by the Lord and that he wasn't able to talk. And so finally, when John the Baptist is born, there's this wonderful time where Zechariah can finally talk again. And he, it's recorded all in Luke 1. Zechariah's song closes out that chapter. But it's this wonderful testimony of God's provision in their lives, despite all the circumstances, all the external things. And so moving on in the story, though, going into Luke 2, uh, verses 8 through 15, this is where we read about the angels appearing before the shepherds. I'm going to read it to you right now, if I can find it in my Bible here. Um, but it just talks about how the shepherds were out in their fields at night. And so that's where we open up with their story. It says, There were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. But the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today, in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let's go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. Now, of course, you know, there, there's this wonderful excitement, this anticipation of things that were to come. And so the angels, they promised something. You know, they, they said that there was going to be peace on earth for those in whom God's favor rests. And so the question becomes, you know, well, why was Jesus' arrival peaceful? Like, let's just look at his circumstances. As, as working class citizens of Jewish society, the shepherds are what we would consider probably blue collar people. You know, like they were well to do, but you know, they weren't rich. They just had very long hours. You know, there wasn't like a break where you could just leave the flock. They were always working. And so their, their knowledge of the Messiah was probably a little bit limited. And so for them to look forward to the Messiah, they probably were looking forward to like a king or something, right? They were looking to this great king with a grandiose sort of arrival where maybe, you know, like legions of soldiers are all backing him in like a parade almost of sorts. But instead, Jesus came in humble circumstances. He was born in some manger with a bunch of stinky, unwashed, probably very, very dirty animals. And this mother that was somehow a virgin, like, now if I'm putting myself in the shoes of the shepherds, I have to ask myself, you know, like, how is this really the Messiah? And yet, because those angels appeared to them, because the angels came and told them that there was good news, that there was going to be joy and peace to all the world, because of this little baby, that changes things. That changes things drastically. And so the question then becomes, how do you think it's better that Jesus arrived in the world as he did instead of being born into a royal family? Now, just a, a kind of a, a little recap of last week, Kylie talked about how there is something to be redeemed by Jesus' arrival in the way that he did. You know, like we can have this hope, we can have this affirmation knowing that Jesus' life story, all his descendants, they were broken people. They were people that really did nothing to deserve the grace of Christ, the grace of God. And yet, they were used by God to bring about this wonderful news, this wonderful baby boy. And so, again, Jesus' arrival is so much better than him being a royalty because God with us, Emmanuel, this little baby, he's in the most naive like the most pure, innocent form he could have ever taken. He's a little baby. Like, everyone loves babies. Like, you can't be mad at a baby for being a baby. You know, it's cute when they coo and, and they cry and they poop and they eat. And it's, it's wonderful. It's disgusting, but it's wonderful. You know, like, everyone loves babies. But, again, Jesus came in those humble circumstances to show that God is not out of tune with what 
we really, really need. God is in tune and he knows that we need an example of how to live. And that's exactly what Christ was. And so we're going to jump back uh, backwards a little bit in the story to Joey, Joey, excuse me, Mary and Joseph's story. Um, just for a little bit of context, um, they were both very well esteemed in their Jewish cultures. Um, but again, we have to put themselves in their shoes. And so we're going to read here in Matthew 1, 18 through 19, um, how it kind of looked a little bit scandalous for them in their circumstances. And so um, reading in verses 18 from Matthew 1, it says, This is how the birth of Jesus Christ came about. His mother, Mary, was pledged to be married to Joseph. But before they came together, she was found to be with child through the Holy Spirit. Because Joseph, her husband, was a righteous man and did not want to expose her to public disgrace, he had in mind to divorce her quietly. Now, just pause right there and let's just put ourselves in Mary and Joseph's shoes. Like, I don't know about you, and I mean, Kyle and I have only been married about nine months at this point, not even nine months yet. But if she was pregnant right before our wedding, I would be very, very upset. Like, anybody, anybody can relate to that. And so they were not in a place where they probably felt like they were in the best place to start a marriage. And so that's not how I would choose to start a marriage. Um, but again, the, the question we have to ask ourselves is peace for them. You know, they had their preferred idea of what peace was going to look like. They probably preferred to not be pregnant, first of all, probably preferred for them to go ahead and be married and to enjoy each other, to enjoy each other, all the promises of marriage and what that brought and the peace and joy that that would bring. But yet, Again, Mary is pregnant, and somehow Joseph just has to trust that, the, that what she's telling him, that the Holy Spirit came upon her and conceived the baby inside of her, like, he has to trust that that is true. Now, again, like, I'm just trying to put myself in Joseph's mind, like, I don't see how I can really buy into that, but yet, because they know that this is the foretold Messiah, that they were assured that this is going to be something that would change the world forever they trusted in god and because of their trust and their obedience i mean mary herself even said that she was the lord's humble servant ready to do whatever he would ask and because of that we now have this hope thousands of years later because they were willing to trust now again god would have worked this i believe in any way that he would have you know he was going to provide a way for us to be saved but man like of all the circumstances, of all the ways that he could have came into the world, he had to choose that way. Like, but no, like he really did. Because that, again, it just shows that this was something that was so, just, it turned our whole world upside down. Like this was something that the world was not ready for. And yet it's still impacting the world today. And so just as a little bit of some ending thoughts, the same awe and wonder um, that all the people and the nativity story had, you know, it, it applies for us today as well. You know, we, we're going through life and we can feel like we're in places where we, we're not really experiencing all the promises that God has offered us, right? But again, we, we're supposed to be able to have this hope. We're supposed to be able to have peace in this time of, of craziness and darkness. I mean, when the world right now is so just speeding up, you know, our, our stores are full of people our wallets are getting lighter and lighter, it seems like. But again, God comes to bring peace. And so just as a point of reflection, I would ask yourself, you know, has God, when you ask God to work in your life, does he usually change your circumstances? Or on the flip side, does he just prepare you to work through your circumstances? You know, like, again, like I could ask for a million dollars every single day, but at the same time, God provides in such a beautiful way. I don't need a million dollars. You know, like I, I, I'm able to be content and to know that God loves me, that God provides for me, despite whatever I may do. Like God is with me and he's on my side. He loves me and he's going to provide. And so that's, that's just a, a kind of a thought for you to be thinking on, you know, that God is listening. God is here and he's interested in everything about your life. He's not just simply out to provide you with the easiest thing, the most convenient thing. He doesn't want you just to have what you want. I mean, again, let's just be honest. If God always gave us what we want, do you think that'd make us better people? No, like God teaches us some things through very strange 
unbelievable circumstances sometimes. I mean, there are countless stories of, in our own church even, of how God has provided in ways that went well beyond our imaginations. And so that truth is still applying to us today. You know, we, we are here and we get to enjoy all these wonderful emotions and feelings. And while they are very valid, the peace that I'm talking about, the peace that is promised by the coming of Jesus, that peace is something that goes beyond any earthly understanding. It's peace that is truly heavenly. I love how the, 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 the Christmas song Silent Night talks about it. It says to sleep in heavenly peace. In my mind, I think about that, and it's not peace and quiet. It's not time for me just to rest. Heavenly peace is really, really more about me resting and knowing that God loves me, that God has provided for me, that he loves me in such a way that he wants me to transform my life, that I may be a blessing to others. And that's amazing. I'm just like you. Like I, I, I hear that so many times, and I can become almost desensitized to it. But the truth is still that God loves us and he would go to the cross even just for one, even just for me, even just for you. And so the peace of Christ, the peace of knowing that Christ is here and he's come, and he is the savior, the Messiah, you know, he may not be this royalty. He wasn't a king on his time here on earth, but yet we know that there is a hope that he is going to come and he's going to have justice. He's going to make all things right. But in the meantime, he's going to make all things new. And so that starts with you and me. That starts in our hearts. It starts in, with us knowing that peace is not something we just have to talk about. Not something you have to pretend that's, that might be real. But peace can be something that we can have today. And so my prayer for you today as we enjoy the cold and we enjoy snuggling with our family members and our loved ones. You know, we, we get to have this peace knowing that while, yes, there are people on earth that love us and that provide for us, our Heavenly Father is looking out for us too. And he's providing in ways that we're still discovering. Again, the shepherds had no idea what to expect, and yet they were blessed mightily. The wise men were these foreign people that came that had heard the prophecies about the Messiah, and yet when they came, they saw this little baby. Like, that's wonderful. You know, they, they finally realized that this was the king. This was the one that had been told about for centuries up to that point. Again, Mary and Joseph, their idea of peace was wrecked. You know, it was totally flipped upside down. But yet they were, for, they were made better by it because the Lord provided for them in such ways that it brought them closer. And it, again, because they were faithful, it brought them to a place where God was even more favorable toward them. And so, again, my prayer for you would simply be that you would just rest in the peace of God, knowing, again, that you were loved. And at this time of season, as chaotic as it may be, you're not alone. You know, we, we have each other, but more than that, we, we have God and that God is interested in us. And so would you join with me in praying today? Dear God, we, uh, we just thank you so, so much for today. Lord, we thank you that, again, we, we have this technology that allows us to kind of have church without actually being in a church building. Um, God, it's just amazing what you've been able to use us uh, people to do and to create. Um, Lord, I just want to lift up people today, Lord, that just need to know that you love them first and foremost. God, that there's nothing we could do that would ever make you not love us. God, help us not to use that, though, as an excuse to live in our ways, that, that we would truly look to you, that we would submit to you. God, that we would look for you in ways that we are uncomfortable with sometimes. We would be comfortable with being uncomfortable. God, that we would look to you to see how you can transform us and make our hearts new. God, we thank you again for your church, not just Lyman Wesleyan Church, but Lord, for your global church, that it started with some shepherds in a field, that it started with a virgin mother and her husband-to-be. God, you use remarkable circumstances, remarkable people, and make them extraordinary. And so God, our prayers is that you would use us, you would use sinful, broken people and use us to bring joy and hope and peace and love. God, we, we just simply are amazed by you. Lord, be with us as we go about our days. Protect us. Keep us safe on the roads if we travel. Uh, 
Lord, we, uh, we just love you. We lift up all these things in your name. We ask this all. Amen. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. Um, we will be sending out that Word document, so you guys will feel free to go along with that Bible study if you want to reflect a little bit more. I know for me, personally, it helps a lot more when I either get to hear it and when I get to write it down. And so, if you're like me, you might look forward to seeing that soon. Hope you guys have a great day. Stay safe, stay warm, and we will definitely be with you next week. Bye, LWC. See you later. Oh, come let us adore him. Oh, come let us adore him.